give you a... <laughs> okay, but I'm not going to sit behind the podium. Um, thank you, General Pollitt, very much. It is my pleasure to lead off um, several of our DISA seniors today to talk to you all about the upcoming acquisitions. They are working in the planning stages um, at different levels of maturity. Um, I encourage you, after each of them comes up, to ask a few questions, and then we'll have time for a Q&A at the very end as well. Um, next chart, please. Oh, I'm doing it, sorry. My folks in the Procurement Directorate and our DICO organizations, the Defense Information Technology Contracting Organization, are committed to doing the best job we can to buy the products and the services that our customers, and I know Tony Montemarano hates that word, that they need to get their mission done. Um, I challenged my folks when I came on board to try and see where we could standardize our processes and streamline things to try and do things faster, but not just faster to do it in a quality way so that we could have the best confidence that when we put a contract in place, it gave us the product, our service, the capability that we needed. And that we upheld ourselves with the highest integrity and ethical behavior. That's another thing that's very important to me and very important to all of our contracting professionals. What DITCO provides to everyone who comes to us with a requirement is the full spectrum of acquisition from planning through award, post-award administration, and eventually close out of a contract. We have a multifunctional organization that has all the right skills and talents to put effective contracts in place. I don't just have contracting officers and contract specialists. I have the financial management people who bring in the, your money that you send to us and give it to us so we can get it on contract. I have IT specialists who help us understand things from a technical perspective and manage all my systems, because we need the systems to get stuff done. I have telecom specialists who understand the telecom business. I have legal advisors who help us in the required areas where legal um, reviews are needed. So we cover the full spectrum. And we buy essentially what you all need in the telecom and IT environment, products and services. Our our desire and our intent is to make sure that you get what you need so you get done what you need. Um, an example that comes to my mind in the last year or so is Afghan Mission Network. We expedited buying equipment for that so that they could get over there, get it tested, installed, and operational to meet the warfighter need. I have DICO organizations strategically placed around the globe to meet the need of the customers in those areas. I have four primary buying offices. My main concentration is at Scott Air Force Base, DICO Scott. I have two divisions there. One's our telecom division that buys SATCOM, circuits, um, all the typical things in that area. I have a large IT division that buys IT products and services. I have a buying division here at Fort Meade. We've, always, we've called ourselves DICO NCR, and I think we're going to have to change that now that we've moved to Fort Meade. But they buy the same types of thing in the IT environment, focusing primarily on DISA. The folks at Scott do DISA and external. I have an office in Stuttgart, supporting the COCOMs in that area, UCOM, AFRICOM, and CENTCOM. The CENTCOM support comes primarily from a DITCO Europe branch in Bahrain. 
We have an office in the Pacific, in Hawaii, that supports the PACOM area. Um, and then we have a couple of auxiliary offices out of Ditko Scott, located at Fort Huachuca, supporting JIDIC, and now supporting um, CSD out of Chambersburg. And this basically repeats what I just said. Um, these slides will be posted. This is, I'm telling you this because we've had questions you all want, um, at least those of you from industry want to understand that. And our customers are across DOD. As long as it's in our core area of expertise, we will support that. We are a defense working capital funded organization. We are a fee for service organization. We charge a 2% fee. And I think we deliver pretty good service for that. Um, we have a few non-DOD customers on special um, um, things that, that it makes good sense for, for us from a DISA perspective and a DOD perspective to give some occasional support to. What you're gonna hear today are briefings that are gonna tell you what we know right now that we're gonna be planning in the next few months. I'm hoping this is going to give you valuable information that you can use to make business decisions. I welcome your feedback because we have changed the way we've presented this information this year. So I'm hoping it is going to be of added benefit. And if it isn't, I do want to hear about it so we can improve next year's process. So these are the folks that you're going to hear from. Mr. Mark Arndoff will follow me, and then we'll have a lunch break, and then we'll start with the rest of the folks um, who are going to be talking to you. You've heard several times today from speakers in DISA how important industry involvement is in what we do. We really can't do our job without your help. To that extent, I want to make sure that we are enabling the right kind of communication with you all. I don't, from a contracting procurement perspective, I don't want us to be closed book. Um, you may have seen uh, Dan Gordon's memo, uh, myth busting, about engaging better with industry. We were always doing some of those things and we're trying to do better at some of the other things. And I'll talk more about that later. But making sure we have the right kind of conversations and discussions with y'all is, is critical to making sure that we put a contract out that clearly states our requirements and has the right kind of structure so that we get the, the needed capabilities we're expecting. So some of the things we're doing you're going to hear from Ms. Sharon Jones, who is the director of our Office of Small Business Programs later. We are very committed to maximizing the participation of small businesses in the work that we do here at DISA. And she's going to talk to you more about that. Mr. Dave Mihalchik um, and his organization leads a chief engineers panel. One of the things we're talking about is how we can um, use that panel to bring in industry to talk to us about new technology so that we have the right kind of forum, uh, a broad forum across DISA for folks to come in and talk to and make sure that we know the latest about all the technology. From a procurement perspective, when we put out our RFIs, we're trying to make our RFIs better. Better describe what we're looking for an RFI we use primarily for market research. When we ask for capability packages, we're going to tell you what we want to see in them and how we're going to look at them. And then something we probably haven't done as well as we could, but we're going to work harder on it in the future, is giving you feedback once we look at your capability packages. So you know what our preliminary assessment is of how that meets what we're thinking about. By the same token, we use a lot of draft RFPs. Um, that is another 
early way to communicate with you what our need is before we put a formal RFP out, request for proposal. The only caveat I would say is don't start building your proposal on that and get so far down the path that you can't adjust if the formal RFP comes out with slightly different requirements, because that does happen. Because we ask for your comments and suggestions as a result of the draft RFP. And to the extent we accept those, we make changes based on those. So it is rare that you will see a formal RFP that is an exact mirror of a draft RFP. One of the other things I've challenged my folks to do is to make sure that we engage in discussions, um, especially in the competitive environment, in a more meaningful way. Discussions can take many forms. They're always going to start with a written evaluation notice. But they can also be verbal, face-to-face, um, -face or telephonic. And that can sometimes help make sure that we, government and, and offerer, understand each other and understand the concern voiced in the evaluation notice and get an idea from you all how you think you'd answer it before we get that formal written response back. The intent is to get better understanding and to hopefully shorten any discussion period. Um, while we're always interested in an award without discussions, a lot of our stuff is complex and sometimes you just cannot make a good decision without engaging in discussions. By the same token, once we get to an award for the unsuccessful offerers, you may have seen a letter accompanied by some debriefing charts. We're trying to add the verbal um, contact with that because a lot of times the words on a chart don't quite get the point across. I would tell you the words on the chart are the same ones that are presented to the source selection authority. Um, but you all want to know why you didn't win and what you can do better in the future. And sometimes that is more effectively communicated verbally. Um, so that's something that we're going to be really pushing um, as we go forward. It used to be standard when you awarded a contract, at least when I grew up in contracting, to have a kickoff meeting or a post-award conference. We got away from that, at least in some organizations that I've been part of, in our rush to get into execution. But really, kickoff meetings can set the stage for success because you can sit down government and contractor team together, go through the contract and the requirements, and understand what we on the government are expecting and what the deliverables are, on what schedule, so that we all have the same level of understanding and we don't get down into execution and find out, well, no, I thought that was due in two months instead of today, that type of thing. Or, no, I thought you only wanted this much of this capability, not this much capability. So kickoff meetings are important. Making the time for them is important. And I am challenging our program offices to make sure that they make time for that. We do a lot of competitive acquisitions. Our competition rate is typically in the high 80s, whether it's a full and open um, contract award or it's a fair opportunity opportunity to a task order award or a delivery order award. We have new source selection procedures from the Department of Defense from OSD issued in March that apply to our full and open competitions. But I'm also applying parts of them down at the task order level. It isn't so much, the significance of that isn't so much that they changed from what we were doing, although there were some changes. The significance is 
For those of y'all who've been working with the defense industry and you have Army customers and you have Navy and Air Force and ODA, other defense agency customers, and we all did maybe things a little bit differently, now we're all doing things the same way. There's room for customization and tailoring, but essentially we're all following the same process and procedures. And that is a first for DOD. The big thing that changed is the definitions for color adjectival ratings and the fact that you can combine your technical and risk assessment and there are special definitions for that. I encourage y'all to take a look at that or get your contracts people to explain it to you um, because you need to know how we're looking at your proposal when we go into evaluations. This next chart shows you the the source selection process we use. I had a question earlier from a young lady about low price technically acceptable because she'd heard something about that in one of our track sessions. There are several different methods that we can use for source selection. Full trade-off, which a lot of people call best value. Well, let me tell you, best value is the expected outcome from any source selection method. Okay, so they're all best value. Full trade-off is looking at all, looking at price and non-price factors. Typically technical management, past performance, and cost price. And you're trading among all of those depending on how you've defined the importance of each of those. And that's appropriate in a source selection that's very complex, that perhaps has some risk areas. Another method that we use, and I'm encouraging the folks, both in our contracting shops and our program offices to use when it's appropriate, is low price technically acceptable. Because low price technically acceptable typically gets us through to an award sooner than full trade-off. Low price technically acceptable, we make an assessment of acceptability or non-acceptability on the proposal, proposals. And then we award to the lowest price of all the te technically acceptable proposals. And that can be, as I said, quicker than a full trade-off. There's one other method that you won't find written down in the DOD source selection procedures, but that we do sometimes use here, and that's called a performance price trade-off. And we do the technical acceptability determination, and we look at past performance, and we look at cost price, and then the trade-off is between past performance and cost price. That's sort of an interim between the full trade-off full trade and low price technically acceptable. We don't use it all the time, but when we think that's the right way to, to use it, we do. We use what we call a golden thread that we follow from the requirements to the identified risk areas, which drives the development of the evaluation criteria because the evaluation criteria should be based on your high risk areas and the things that you expect to provide differentiation among offers to help us make that best value decision. And then it follows into execution in our cost and our monitoring and what we surveil during performance. We're not perfect at it, but we are working constantly on making it better. This is a typical source selection organization, SSA, source selection authority, source selection advisory council of senior leaders, a source selection evaluation board with teams at the technical past performance and cost price. We all know we're going into an environment where our budgets are going to be impacted. So making sure that we've got the right contract type and the right terms and conditions is going to become more and more important to us. And making sure we document our past performance in CPARs so that we, that helps us in the future as we make selections is going to be very important to us. Competition is extremely important to us. It isn't just that 
we're expected to achieve maximum competition. But competition helps us get the best offerer with the best capability and the best price. And sometimes it varies on what, which of those are the most important, but competition helps us maintain the capabilities we need. And to the extent that we can, we don't want to be locked into a sole source environment after we make an initial award. So we're going to be looking at our strategies to see how we can maintain competition throughout the life cycle of an effort. We do pretty good on competition and we do pretty good on small business. You'll hear more from Ms. Jones about small business, but we typically achieve our competition goal. Where we're really focusing is not just competition, but effective competition. Effective competition means we get two or more offers. Not that we did an RFI and 11 guys responded to it, and we did a draft RFP and we got questions from eight people, and then we put out the RFP and we got one offer. That is not effective competition. And we are not interested in maintaining an incumbent solely because they're the incumbent. We want competition to get us to the right contractor to help us do what we need to do. Just a few stats for those of you that know that Encore 2 is our big uh, multiple award contract. Um, we have done 330 orders to this point. Um, we've awarded 16% to small business. That's something I want to change. I want to take advantage of the language in the Jobs Act, and you'll hear more from Ms. Jones about that, to help us increase those awards to small business. We have cut the amount of time and material awards under Encore 2, and we are getting more and more into a performance-based environment. This is our website that you can go to to find out more information about all of the contracting opportunities and the DITCO processes and procedures. Working with you all is critical to getting us the capabilities that we need to get the mission done. I really encourage you to give us feedback today. There'll be, there's usually a post-conference um, survey. We'll have some questions around our for, uh, industry forum in it. How, you know, General Pollock talked about how we think this is an effective environment combining the customer conference and industry day. I want your feedback on how you feel about it and how you would feel about it if the customer conference next year is out of this local area. Does that change your perspective? So please be sure to give us that kind of feedback.